First, I would like to introduce um, Ignacio Chapella. He is an Associate Professor of Microbial Ecology at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, he has used his training as an ecologist and mycologist to the study of symbiosis in forest ecosystems and in temperate and tropical environments. His current work focuses on enabling field-based detection, monitoring and mapping of microbial materials, including those resulting from genetic engineering through the use of distributive decentralized strategies under direct control of local communities, such as those in southern Mexico. He has been a member of many advisory and policy-making bodies, such as the US National Academy of Sciences Committee on the Environmental Impact of the Release of Transgenic Crops. We also have um, Dr. Kevin Esfeld. He has a PhD in biochemistry from Harvard. He subsequently worked under the advisory of George Church at the Weiss Institute, where he helped develop the CRISPR system. Currently an associate professor at the Media Arts and Sciences at the MIT Media Lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he leads the Sculpting Evolution Group that explores evolutionary and ecological engineering. Together with the communities of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, his group is advancing the Mice Against Ticks project, which aims to prevent tick-borne diseases by releasing engineered heritably immune mice. Uh, in 2013, he was the first to describe how the CRISPR-Cas technology could be used to build gene drive systems and alter wild populations. Um, moderating the discussion this morning, we have um, Dr. Ernst Ulrich von Weisacker. He is um, the honorary president of the Club of Rome. Um, among many career changes he told me about, he was a professor of uh, biology, uh, then university president, um, he was a member of the uh, German Parliament and Chair of the Environmental Committee from 1998 to 2005. I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Can you switch it on? Very good, thank you. Um, let me add uh, two more elements of my biography. One is I used to be the chairman of the Association of German Scientists of Federation. And now Hartmut Kassel is here, my decessor, uh, the present chairman of the association. And then my last um, assignment in academia was of the Dean of the School of Environmental Science and Management of the University of California in Santa Barbara. Uh, this may add a bit to my wild uh, kind of career. But now, uh, this fantastic morning introduction had a certain bias, if you wish, to um, identifying problems of gene drive, which is absolutely necessary in the current public debate of enthusiasm um, over potential for gene drive. But for this room, it may be helpful first to have Kevin Esfeld uh, giving some replies also to what has been said in the morning, and then we will come to a good dialogue, I'm sure. So, Kevin. All right. So thank you, first of all, it is an honor to be here today. And thank you, all of you, for being here to be critical, because far from saying that, oh, gene drive is only a good thing. I am the one who must hold myself morally responsible for any and all consequences of CRISPR-based gene drive because I was the one who decided to tell the world that it was possible. With the advice and agreement of my colleagues, we decided to explain what we believe the technology could do because a CRISPR-based gene drive is no more than CRISPR genome editing encoded into the organism so the organism can do it on its own, generation after generation. And we decided we need to tell the world about this before we even begin experiments in the laboratory, 
because this is not like developing a new drug. If we develop a new drug, then your doctor recommends it to you, you can say no. You can choose not to be affected by the consequences of our work. But if we develop a gene drive system to change the shared environment, even if it's put up for a vote, and you vote against it, but you're outvoted, you're going to be affected one way or another. That's why this kind of technology is fundamentally different from almost all research that is done, at least in the life sciences. It does not allow people the opportunity to opt out because it affects entire communities, inherently. And that means if we don't tell you what we are doing, what we plan on doing, if we don't go to a community and say, is this a problem you're actually having? We think we might be able to address it in these different ways. Then, if we just go ahead and do the research, we're denying you a voice in decisions intended to affect you that you won't be able to opt out of. And we thought that was wrong, and so we decided to call for transparency and also the mandatory use of safeguards in the laboratory. Because one of our major concerns was this is a technology wherein making an edited organism does not make something where we've diverted the resources of that organism for our own benefit, meaning it will not survive and proliferate in the wild. The addition of the gene drive is a sufficient advantage that we believe it can spread in the wild on its own, meaning a single laboratory accident could end up spreading through a species across international borders. So we emphasized in that original paper that no one should do this. No one should build a system like that if they work anywhere near a species that might be affected. Because we know that our work is fallible. We know that our containment practices in the laboratory are not perfect. We know above all else that we are human, that we make mistakes. And so our advice was don't even build them. Don't build something that can spread on its own forever through a population. And we tried to warn all of our colleagues to do this. And what concerns me, I very much appreciate Ricarda's advocacy for stepping back and looking at the meta problem. We tried to warn all of our fellow scientists because we were worried that someone working with CRISPR perhaps for the first time might try to build one of these things, not as a gene drive to spread through the wild, but as a laboratory tool to make it easier to make altered strains in the laboratory. And we got a lot of media coverage. And we attempted to warn scientific societies, particularly of the Drosophila melanogaster fruit fly researchers. And we still failed, because that first paper, which was the second gene drive build, we first built one in yeast. And that one, we built, it was a split drive system. It could not spread forever on its own, even if it escaped the lab. And we built it to disrupt a gene. And at the same time, we built another drive system that could cut the first one and restore the function of the gene. So the first two drive systems, one was to disrupt and the other was to restore. That does not mean that the organism was not still engineered. The assessment that we cannot currently restore a species to being a wild type again is currently true. We have some ideas as to how that might be changed, but we don't actually know how to do it. No. The first example of a drive system that might have spread in the wild was indeed built by scientists who did not realize that it was a gene drive and might spread in the wild at the time they ran those experiments. Which means that for a technology that seven years ago no one even imagined might exist. I'm a huge fan of science fiction, in large part because I think it's important as a scientist in realizing what you might be getting into. And seven years ago, apparently, no one even imagined that a single researcher could build something that might spread to affect an entire species on its own. And now at least the models suggest, and the laboratory results to date, suggest that that is possible. But we failed to warn our colleagues because the first example in flies was made by researchers who did not understand that it could do that. I am concerned by the consequences because I must hold myself morally responsible. But as technologies go, this is comparatively defense biased. I think it's important to discuss some of those security implications. This is something that spreads slowly, because it only spreads parents to offspring. If you sequence the genome, as is becoming ever more efficient, you can always detect it. And as we showed in the yeast, you can build another one that will undo the effects. It will not return the organism to being wild type, but it will undo the effects. 
And anything that is slow, obvious, and easily blocked is what we call defense biased. So I am not overly worried by this technology in particular, save that it allows a single individual who knows how a tremendous amount of power. And I think we all need to invite communities to come together to think of the things that might go wrong. Because the last person you want to test a hypothesis in science is the person who proposed it. Now, the fact that in science, normally the way we do it, we give the job to that exact person is a bit of a problem in science. But it also holds for technology developers because however we might try, no matter how we remind ourselves that it's on us if anything goes wrong, we're still human. We're always going to be biased in favor of our technologies. So that's why I just want to close by saying thank you for coming and being critical and identifying what might go wrong. Because the essence of all of our projects is we want to try to make the smallest possible change that might be capable of solving the problem. Because when you're engineering a system you don't completely understand, you don't want to make a large change, ever. And you should start small before scaling up. And the problem with the original version of this technology, which was my error in presenting it, was in making a beautiful figure that said, oh, we might someday be able to use it for all of these things. And as, as an attempt to spark discussion, how many of you have actually read the full text of a primary research article in the scientific literature recently? The, every word of the actual text and the supplementary information. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you for being rigorous. Thank you. But most people don't. Most, of, most people read the abstract, look at the figures, and that's it. And so people got this idea that gene drive could be used for all these sorts of things, and that was my bad because I made a beautiful Venn diagram. And in reality, the kind that spreads on its own through an entire species has no possible applications other than potentially malaria. Because I can't think of a single other application, well, perhaps one other in South America, where it might be feasible to get every country harboring the targeted species to agree. And in the absence of that, why are we even bothering? Because there's no, chance, there's no point in even developing the technology if it has no chance of being used in the world. You're just wasting your time. So, that's why we're interested in localization, but it, how can you be confident it will be localized? Those are the questions that we must answer, but I think we need to focus on those questions rather than saying, oh, well, what if it's used in Palmer Amaranth? It's not going to be used in Palmer Amaranth. We've done everything we can to ensure that this technology will not be used for for-profit purposes, and we've gone on the record doing this, and we have most of the relevant IP. And in fact, if you don't even trust that judgment, consider the people who have the relevant IP are also the people who have the CRISPR IP. Is it in their interest to jeopardize that tremendous money train by lending their licensing to a technology such as Gene Drive that could readily blow up in their faces? I think it's unlikely. So we'll see if we can actually keep this nonprofit and develop and use this technology wisely, if at all. So I've talked for plenty long enough. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, of course, I found it very reassuring uh, that you sort of start by identifying potential dangers and say this is uh, what we have to look at and this is essentially the philosophy of the three organizing uh, organization here, uh, including certainly the Federation of German Scientists. And uh, nevertheless, uh, we will go deeper into the potential problems and I now give, give the floor to Ignacio. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, first and foremost. And more than that, it's actually an honor um, to be on this forum, but also to be in this audience. I recognize that this is a highly selected, I, I know that this is a public event, but, um, but I see faces across the room who are uh, very knowledgeable in all these dif very different aspects of things. So it's a real privilege and an honor to be here. And, uh, and really fun to be here with both of you. Um, I want to say that I am here as a conversant and I feel like um, Ernst is our senior conversant here with the expertise in ecology and environmental science that goes deep in time. Um, I also wanted to um, take the opportunity to say a couple of other biographical uh, points that were mentioned that might be useful to uh, help in the conversation, which is what I really want to do. 
uh, conversation. And uh, I would like to point out that I have had experience both inside and out of academia. I'm, I'm a late uh, comer into the actual full-blown academic environment as a teacher, for example. So I refused to teach for a very long time until I felt like it was time. Um, I, kind of, I grew up as a scientist to the point where I felt that I could teach. And well, let me say, I did it differently. I did uh, learning by teaching. Uh, that's what I do. So I'm okay, now learning. Good. <laughs> I'm now beginning to learn uh, for the last 20 years or so that I've been at Berkeley, 22. Um, but also, I've been in and out of uh, the private sector. I used to work in Basel when I was much younger um, at Sando, that some of you know very well. That became eventually Novartis and so on, the whole history. Uh, and that also gave me a very interesting growth experience and uh, in, uh, insider information on the dynamics of this thing that we call science, that's such a hugely amorphous thing and changing thing that uh, goes under the name of science. The other one point that I wanted to bring up is that later on in life, I became very engaged, and I feel like you uh, uh, are becoming engaged in that same way with the consequences of m my work as a scientist um, with regards to people outside of the lab and people outside of academia and people outside of even the, the world of the book, let's call it that way. And um, that might be the most important learning period in my life uh, when I work with a large coalition of indigenous communities in southern Mexico. And I was also working in Ecuador, in Colombia, and in interaction with many different indigenous communities uh, who understand things in a very different but not less powerful way. So uh, that's where I come from. If, if you hear me say weird things, maybe you might understand. Um, I would like to just maybe uh, make two points of disagreement uh, to start with, with your statements, uh, because they're important in this historical sense. I disagree with the idea that we are in a completely different environment in terms of interventions into, by, into life, into living systems, and the consequences. I think we have been dealing with the idea that an intervention that is thought to do something um, moves by itself in the environment. There's nothing really particularly new, conceptually speaking, between this new RNA-guided DNA uh, splicing methods and the older methods of so-called genetic engineering because they are both um, introduced into reproducing organisms that become released into the environment. So the question of self-reproduction and, and propagation and um, unaccountable spread has been with us for quite a while. Not that it is better or worse or whatever. The important thing here, I think, is that we can look back into history to try and develop concepts and ideas of how to think about this new um, a proposal of an intervention into the environment uh, from the past, because we, we have experience. The first intervention of this kind really happened in the early 70s in the San Francisco Bay Area where I currently work. And, uh, and ever since we have this almost 40 years of experience that I think is very important to take into account when thinking about these things, because it is important to ask the question, for example, what happened with the promises of those technologies, so-called technologies, of those interventions? And the answer is not very much, like I think you are hinting at. The idea that the potential of this new intervention is actually limited, that you, you talked about, uh, Kevin, um, is, was there also in, historic, in the historical record. What's interesting, though, is that we forgot. We forgot to check and go back to those promises from the past to find out what happened. And I feel like it's, it's a little bit what's, what you're describing in your experience, current experience, that you say, I can see that we should be asking this and this and this question, and that these people and those people who haven't even asked the first question um, are moving forward with, they should be much more careful with what they're doing and especially what they're saying. Because the other thing that I heard you say is, um, 
much of what's happening has to do with what people say they will do or they can do, what people interpret from your papers or your patents or whatever, um, and that is very different from the actual reality of what is feasible and what you can expect to happen. So uh, this entangling, this, the role of media in generating an image that we have to confront and feel that we have to confront as if this was going to take over the world and all these things um, is as important. It is as important to deal with that image as it is to deal with the actual interventions in the field. So those are two points of somewhat disagreement and uh, notes on, on, on your statements, Kevin. I won't be much longer. Um, I, I do have the, I feel the burden of bringing up the conversation to a different level. Again, I'm very thankful for the uh, earlier, earlier presentations because we don't necessarily need to deal with the nitty gritty of all this. There are so many important questions to ask. And when I think about these problems in the new context of RNA-guided uh, um, DNA splicing, um, I, I, I find it useful to use the concept of scale and to use the concept of scale in time, in space, and in phylogenetic relatedness. Let me try and see if I can float an, 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 an example of how, to, how I think about this. I make a release of a genetically modified organisms or whatever means into the environment. The question that I think is relevant is to ask, what is the scale at which I should be looking at for the spread, the movement, the, the consequences of this intervention? In space, that's the obvious one that most people think. If I want to um, affect the population of a mosquito in, uh, I don't know, wherever it might be, um, how far is it going to go? Is it going to recognize national boundaries, you know, any political boundaries of a canton or a state? Um, but then there is, the, there is the dimension of time. How long do I need to be looking? How long can I expect to be, exp to, to be finding consequences of my intervention? And then there is the scale of phylogeny, of phylogenetic connectedness, which is if I introduce this piece of DNA, this alteration into the environment and release it in a, in a self-reproducing system in a population, um, how far do I need to look, phylogenetically speaking, to look for the consequences of my intervention? Um, again, we can draw important uh, history from the gen normal, normal, if you will, genetic engineering of the past in that we now know that what was theoretically pointed out at the very beginning, the possibility of horizontal gene transfer as a way of phylogenetically skipping from one uh, one species to another. Uh, at the beginning, it was, it was said, no, that's just so difficult and impossible. Uh, now we know that it's actually quite common. So the phylogenetic dimension is just as important as the spatial and the temporal dimension in thinking about this. Point number one. Point number two has to do with the question of who. I always tell my students, Asking the question of who, the who's of an environmental problem is very important. I think you make this point else in some of your writing. The who am I working for? Who am I um, affecting by this intervention? Who am I to do this intervention? What power do you have? And I see, Kevin, you asking those questions exactly in the same, in the same breath. And uh, I was, I was uh, talking to Brian Dowd Uribe who has a lot of uh, experience in Western Africa, uh, working with communities there who are, are confronting the, the, inter, the introduction, I'm sorry, the introduction of genetic engineering in crops. And the question that was raised also in genetic, pre-CRISPR, let's say, genetic engineering, was the same question that's being asked today, which is, what is prior informed consent? And who can give prior informed consent, to whom, for how long, 
what is the delimitation in space, time, and phylogeny of that prior informed consent? Is it okay to just bring the leaders of recognized political leaders of a community in uh, wherever, even Switzerland? Uh, or do I need to run a referendum? And do I believe and trust the referendum to represent in time, in space, in phylogeny, the consequences and the responsibilities that go with releasing this thing. And uh, Brian was telling me, um, you know, in, in gene drives, I do not believe that it is possible ever in the Western African context to obtain a prior informed consent that would be um, defensible. Not only because the people who are being called onto the table might not be at all the people that might represent, for example, seven generations down the line, or 20 villages behind the, the road or, or the railway station, but also because um, the, the knowledge that we might have about the intervention might be so limited, even for yourself or myself, the knowledge that we have might be so limited that the concept of informed consent becomes really moot and becomes actually, and this is Brian speaking, see, it becomes actually a way of derogating my responsibility in my intervention onto the shoulders of the people that I'm calling onto the table, the ecosystems that I am calling to be affected by my intervention. So I know that I don't know, and I think that's one of the big statements that you make and that you just made. I know, I know what I don't know, and I know that I also know many things that I cannot even imagine yet. How am I to go and call people over and say, here, I'm giving you prior informed consent to do something in which I really do not have enough knowledge myself? And you have to say yes or no. Um, this, is, this is, to me, a really, really powerful problem that has to do with the biology of the problem and, again, has to do with the question of scale. Um, I really don't know how this is going to play out, but I know from my experience in industry that uh, the moment you have patents involved as a publication, and I rec fully recognize that the patent system is a way of publishing, it's a way of making public and becoming transparent, uh, but the moment you bring that into the picture, whether you want to profit from it or not, is not the point. The point is you set a clock ticking that makes it impossible for you to say, what if the scale that I need to be asking is, you know, the continental scale or the historical time scale when I know that my patent uh, uh, is going to run out in 20 years? So what are the pressures that are brought into this whole equation of decision making by the, the actual pressures of the patenting system, the money making system by whoever might be the holder of that patent, and, 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 the, and, the, and the time that, that, keeps, that keeps moving forward. Um, I, need, I need to bring up some notes about, there are a couple. Not, not too many. Really. Not too many, no, 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 no. I'll do one, <laughs> two minutes, one, two minutes. Um, there is, there is a, an, an interesting couple of um, publications recently. Um, one came out a, couple, a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, some of your colleagues signed it. Um, we have um, Eric Lander. We have uh, David Liu. It is a call for a moratorium on, um, they call it you know, gene editing on human germline. It sounds as though it doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about. They say, we are the scientists who develop this and who are really, have the pulse of these developments. And we are saying we shouldn't do human germline interventions with um, uh, gene editing. I find it actually interesting that um, Emmanuel Charpentier is there in the list, but not Jennifer Doudna from my university. And I wonder what the politics are of that. I don't really know. Um, but any, anyway, they say we shouldn't do it. Why? Because this is an open-ended intervention that is self-reproducing in a population, human population. 
that they say will affect an entire species. So talk about or think about an intervention that it will, would probably be monitored and followed with incredible detail if you ever intervened into humans. And yet, these researchers are saying we really don't have the capacity to follow up and responsibly consider the consequences. This is one species in isolation of its environmental and ecological context. So I feel like a paper like that should have uh, uh, been preceded by a paper on the ecological release of things like what you're suggesting all the time, right? That because if worrying about this one species, humans, and the humans who allow themselves to be intervened in uh, uh, germline modification is so important, how important is it to deal with the whole ecosystem and the biosphere as a whole? Because we really don't know where the limits are for this intervention. Do we even have the tools for monitoring, which is what I've been working on, the question of where do I look? Why do I, what do I look for? Kevin, you say they're easy, obvious to detect. They're obvious to detect as long as they keep doing what you think they were going to do, but we know that evolution changes what things do. You know, you're welcome to, to answer to that. But I, th I, I sense... Country a perhaps uh, return to more discussion. And let me just finish by saying that it, I think it's important that we, to recognize that we don't even have the tools to deal with the environmental, environmental and evolutionary dimensions of what these interventions involve. Okay. Uh, I very much like what you said about uh, this uh, moratorium on human uh, genome interventions, etc., and giving a parallel of morale for interventions into ecosystems. That is a very important point and uh, to certainly be recognized. But there are other points. Um, yes. Um, you talk about the prior informed cons uh, consent and question whether informed has any meaning before we have some kind of a risk assessment. Right. And that and indeed is something where I believe we could find some kind of a consensus because this was essentially your starting point as well, uh, to say uh, if we have a very interesting, very challenging uh, new technology, we better look at the consequences. And uh, so I very much appreciate your taking that attitude. And the question is, um, do you feel irritated by what Ignacio said in this regard, or uh, uh, are you essentially quite happy? <laughs> well, that was rather a lot to respond to in, a, <laughs> yeah. in an overall summary such as irritated or happy. I think there is <laughs> a great deal that I agree with, and there are certainly some things that I disagree okay, with. Good enough. <laughs> so on to that detectable point in evolutionary stability, these things will evolve on their own. Can we still detect them? The answer is yes, because if you sequence the genome, you will never miss signals of eukaryotic sexually reproducing gene expression together with a CRISPR system, because CRISPR is present in all of us. It's in all of the microbes in our guts that live on our skin. There are CRISPR systems in all of them, but it's not found in our own cells nor in those of other sexually reproducing organisms, meaning it's not in our genes. So if, but if you sequence the DNA of a mosquito or a mouse or what have you, and you see a CRISPR system there together with mouse DNA or mosquito DNA, you know that some human put it there. And you cannot hide that from sequencing. And sequencing, the cost of sequencing has been dropping much faster than Moore's law. So when I say we will always be able to detect it, I mean when you sequence DNA in the environment, and thankfully this is one of those areas where the defense establishment is actually doing good from those of us who care about ecological monitoring, because now with this technology they are in a way forced to begin monitoring wild ecosystems for the presence of human altered DNA, a task to which they have, no one has been particularly eager to do before now because it could result in some uncomfortable findings for many scientists and people in power. But now we're going to have to do it for defense purposes. And it is true when I say that it is slow, obvious, and readily countered, the obvious requires you to go in and sequence 
the metagenome of the ecosystem, which is something that is actively under development and appears to be eminently feasible. May, so you will be able to see it. May, may I respond to that yeah. just for a moment? Because I know you have other points to talk, yeah. to talk about. But I think uh, to this point, I disagree because, yes, it's true that if you take one mosquito, you will be able to sequence it. But how many mosquitoes do you have to look for? And when do you stop looking at mosquitoes to know that it hasn't gone beyond where you think it is? Okay. Yeah. Well, if you, sequence the, if you sequence the river at the base of a watershed, then sequencing is getting so good. The recent DNA detection systems that can detect a particular snippet of DNA, Sherlock and Detector, which are also CRISPR-based, are actually zeptomolar sensitivity. They're basically single molecule sensitivity. How much so, is one shot? How much is one detection? Paper-based diagnostics, and they're working on a few cents, which is going to be our best defense against infectious pandemic disease. Uh, multiply it times how many mosquitoes? Oh, but the point is you only need to detect one. And if a drive system is beginning to spread in that environment, you only need to detect one instance and you will know then, oh, that's unusual, we shouldn't have seen that. Maybe it's a false positive, maybe it's a sequencing read, whatever. Direct a little more resources to that one, you should be able to see it. These are all, but now we're delving into the technical weeds of is this particular detection system viable or not? My assumption is looking at the explosive growth of CRISPR, which, mind you, has, has biased me, because I think of all of these discussions of prior genetic engineering, and I think, because I was there at the beginning of CRISPR, and I was, have a little bit of my career before that, and the c capabilities afforded by CRISPR are just so transcendently beyond what could even have been imagined before, that I feel that, to some extent, the past isn't always an appropriate guide as to what is possible. I agree, but if, if what CRISPR gives you is the possibility of doing the same at an exponential level, shouldn't you take the experience from the past as a precautionary level to guide what you can do with a much more powerful thing? Dynamite compared to nuclear explosion, you know, you should learn from what happened with dynamite use before you go into a nuclear power explosion. Well, but I recall a quote. Someone said, when you see something that is technically sweet, you go ahead and do it, and you argue about what to do about it only after you have had your technical success. That is the way it was with the atomic bomb. Robert Oppenheimer. So it now, continues do to you be think, that way. Now, it has, I would say, it has almost always been that way. Yeah. And the incentive system that we have set up in science encourages precisely that because scientific recognition is afforded to the first person who gets it working. I noted that in that earlier description of, oh, well, Kevin S. Feld and colleagues theoretically described it, but the first actual implementation was in flies. The people who didn't see it coming didn't realize what they were doing and could have caused an accident that would be devastating for the field. Isn't that an instance of that exact same thing? Yeah, I, and I think it's true. And here, I think it's important to recognize cultural differences. Again, I think culture plays a very important role. And I, I think even in, within North America, the, the culture of the coast and the culture of not coast, and I think the Western coast, the left coast even more so, is a culture where risk is a business opportunity. I think in Europe, it is, it is difficult to grasp that concept for many people in Europe. For many people in Europe, a, a risk is something to be, to be avoided. But for many people where I live, a risk is something to seek. You want to be disruptive. Disruption is the great word, right, these days. I want to be disruptive. I don't care. Blow it up. Because if you are on ground level in your disruption, the consequences of that, some people will consider risk, are a business opportunity for you. However you want to look at it, you might be the one who is able to detect it because you know the sequence that you're looking for. You might be the one who is able to fix it or at least hope that people will believe that you will fix it. Whatever the case is, you have a business opportunity for yourself. So risk as a word has very different connotations. I feel from my experience, in, especially in Switzerland, in Europe, and in America, North America, um, has very different cultural valences. Well, don't so, exaggerate. I mean, uh, it is true. In Europe, there is a tradition of um, risk assessment, not risk avoidance. On the other hand, uh, I mean, in America, 
the electronic firm HP. Now, uh, the HP has now a vice president and chief disruptor, you know? <laughs> and they are so proud of it, uh, you know? Uh, and that, on the other hand, would not so easily occur in Germany or in uh, other European countries, would it? <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, my point is, uh, uh, Kevin said at the outset that not, uh, he wants to look at things that are not commercial, not uh, money-making, but helpful which is great, of course. On the other hand, in our world of commerce, it is not so easy to distinguish. And uh, whenever you have a chance of eradicating malaria, uh, everybody will, will think of the billions, how much that would be worth, you know? 12 billion a year in African development is the current estimate, yeah, I believe, yeah. Of course. Uh, but why are, why are we talking about how many billions of dollars a year in African development? Should we, shouldn't we instead be thinking of the of all of the women in Africa who have watched their child die in their uh, arms. I fully, uh, fully of malaria understand this the logic, of, the year. of course. Right? And here's the problem with humanity. Even if we are adopting a consequentialist worldview, thinking about the consequences and trying to tally up the benefits and the risks, which is not the only way to think about ethics, but even if we are, our minds can't really truly grasp numbers. And there's an abundance of, of evidence that. We're especially bad at linking together moral judgments together with concepts of numbers which we can barely grasp to begin with. So I, so I think we have to imagine a woman sobbing over the still body of her child and then imagine that this room is filled with such women and then that this city is filled with such women and that is the number of women who have lost a child to malaria just this year. I am heartened that we've had some discussion earlier saying that we should not, from Doug was saying, it's not really our place to make that decision, and I absolutely agree. That is up to the people who are suffering and dying of malaria, whether they are willing to take on the risks associated with suppressing the populations of the primary mosquito that spreads it. Now, we can help inform that decision. My concern is that we might engage in certain advantages of wealth and power and international trade to try to influence their decision because it makes some of us uncomfortable. And this can go either way. We could force them, we could attempt to force them into it because we believe disruption is a good thing if that is our cultural background. Or we could try to influence them to say that they should not do it and that we might perhaps threaten trade barriers and consequences if they were to do that. And I'm not sure that either of those is our place. Power works both ways. I, I, I... If I may, I, I really am looking forward to hearing from uh, the, the social scientists in the audience, which I am not one, uh, once the questions come up, because these are, these are questions for them, uh, uh, obviously. But on, in this question, on this question of risk, I also wanted to draw attention to another weird publication, recent publication, and that is that uh, National Academy of Sciences uh, report on the management of gene drives, that you probably have seen. Um, that is really very interesting, and the question is quantitative and numerical that I want to raise from this document. What they say is there has never been a proper, and they call it ecological risk assessment. Apparently, social and technology studies people will recognize the difference between a risk assessment and an ecological risk assessment that is, in, at least in the American environment, a very different kind of beast, a very different kind of approach analysis. In and what they describe as the ecological risk, risk assessment, the goal is not to establish a threshold of acceptance for a yes or a no. The goal is to establish some statistical statements about the possibility of failure, the possibility of trouble coming up in a, in a statistical fashion, which I find much more compatible, and they find much more compatible with ecological thinking. Genetic engineering again, the old historical one, and what is now um, being presented as this you know, hyper-stimulated uh, kind, um, has never seen that kind, a, a kind of risk assessment that has probability included in it. 
This is the report saying this. And they wish, they feel that nothing should be released until this kind of statement can be made, which is, again, equivalent to the statement that was made when that first self-sustaining nuclear reaction happened in Chicago uh, with Enrico Fermi, right? Enrico Fermi had the, cap the capability of testing the proof of principle that you could have a self-sustaining nuclear reaction happening. And he couldn't do it until the people at Berkeley gave, them, gave him a number. And it was the probability, the, the, the probability of um, uh, igniting the atmosphere of the planet, basically annihilating the planet, right? They had to come up with a number. And now we know that my neighbor, uh, Teller, cooked the number to fit exactly just below the line that they had a priori decided was going to be right so that uh, they could send the message over to Fermi, I think it must have been Telegraph or something, um, saying, go ahead. And so we have that first nuclear reaction happening. Fortunately, fortunately okay. it didn't come to anything, but the point I'm trying to make is that there is a very important difference between a statistical way of thinking about risk and the, the way we have learned recently of just saying, can we establish a threshold to say yes or no, and that's it, and set, just a set threshold with no statistics involved. I wonder if you have a comment on how would you go about establishing that? It's, it's a, it's a catch-22 situation because you cannot, you would have to have some kind of release to do measurements so that you could produce this kind of number, but you don't want to release before you have the number. It's very difficult. Well, this is exactly why I've been saying we shouldn't be talking about this kind of self-propagating drive system because almost every problem that has been postulated as in need of a solution that gene drive could potentially address involves altering a local and not a local population and not the entire species. Furthermore, the logistics of Africa and, and the challenges of malaria are such that the localized versions that my group and a couple of others have been working on, even if they worked better than we hope, would not suffice to reach true eradication of malaria once and for all. And that actually brings me up to another point, so I'm sorry I'm going to move away. I think we broadly agree that science and risk assessment of the important things, like really, can you imagine doing a risk assessment calculation of, oh, are we going to ignite the atmosphere and kill every living thing on Earth? How confident would you really have to be before you do that? Like, also yes. note that they got the Castle Bravo yield calculations wrong a few years later. So it's a good thing the nitrogen one turned out to be correct because we're all still here. But so, okay, our society is really bad at doing, at doing that. But let's talk about an, another aspect of this, which is the reason why I think a lot of us are concerned about tinkering with life is what it says about our relationship with other living things. We think that life is special for any number of reasons. And there's this big word extinction that people keep throwing around. So first of all, let me say, one of my colleagues in Boston, I shouldn't really say a colleague because he's a journalist, coined the lovely term the extinction invention for CRISPR-based gene drive. Problem is that's a fallacy. If you make a simple model in which you assume that say every mosquito mates with every other mosquito, you introduce a suppression drive into that population, yes, it crashes and they all go away. But if you actually include spatial geography, that you have different populations, some of them patchily distributed, exchanging gene flow between them, and you introduce the suppression drive system, then different patches wink out and get recolonized by unaffected populations nearby, which then get invaded by the drive system and wink out and get recolonized. So you end up with this rock, paper, scissors dynamic. In other words, a single release of a suppression drive cannot drive a species extinct. Only sustained intervention by humans, deliberately introducing it into all of those patches at once, could you actually get rid of the species. So the goal, as I understand it, of my colleagues at Target Malaria, who I don't work with directly, but of course converse with regularly, is not to drive any species of mosquito extinct. It's to reduce their population to the point where malaria transmission is no longer efficient enough for plasmodium falciparum, the causative agent of malaria, to be passed from person to person. The goal is not the extinction of mosquitoes, but it is the extinction of malaria. And so I heard a lot of discussion earlier assuming that extinction is a bad thing, always, that nothing should ever be extinct. So I have a question for the audience now, if I may. Please raise your hand if you think it was a mistake for us to drive smallpox extinct in the wild. Ooh, we have someone brave. I would love to hear from you later in the discussion section. 
Well, I wish smallpox. That actually brings me uh, to one uh, intermediate remark. In five minutes or so, I shall be opening for the floor anyway. So we've touched on a lot of different themes here. This prior and informed consent is a big one. And it's a challenge because it runs into logistical and economic issues. Also, interpretability issues. How can you possibly reach everyone who would be affected by a large-scale intervention like this? There's no, there's no conceivable way. How do you communicate with different cultures whose languages don't even have words for gene or DNA, much less gene drive? How, do you, how can you possibly generate informed consent? It's not possible. And we don't ask for their informed consent when we say, do iodine supplementation in salt that we then sell to them in order to ameliorate micronutrient deficiency. Public health does not use the language of informed consent for good reason. It is not possible on that scale. So we can discuss whether that is a good thing or a bad thing, but we're treating a public health problem in this mm -hmm. case, a public health discussion that is really not traditionally conducted on grounds of informed consent, and we're transplanting that into area of medicine. The other thing that you, you mentioned that was interesting is different cultural visions of this. So I'm always wary of honestly talking just to audiences like probably most of you here, that is Western, educated, scientific, often secular, liberal audiences, because I know how people like us think. I spend most of my time immersed in those kinds of environments. But one of the reasons why we reach out to other kinds of cultures is they have very different views on what is acceptable or even obligatory. So my group works a lot on rodents. We have, a, we have our community guided projects to fight Lyme disease which don't involve gene drive because, again, you start small and see what happens. So in answer to your direct answer to your question, how do you test it? The answer is you don't test it with the version that spreads indefinitely because there is no such thing as a field trial of that version. In the case of Nantucket in the vineyard, we're working on mice that were just heritably immune to Lyme disease because we identify mice that have developed acquired immunity. We identify the genes and those mice have evolved to make them immune and we encode it so that it can be passed on to future generations. So now we have several candidates and we're working on editing the mice to do that. And this is all guided by the communities because as we said, there's different forms of immunity we could introduce from different kinds of mice. There's different ways we could insert it. There's different ways that the mice might be introduced. And it's the community that is guiding us and advising us in our development in the laboratory. And I think a mistake that has been made in the past is that we jump immediately to the question of governance. Who is going to say yes or no to the release? And in this case, I would say, look, I'm not in charge of community governance. That's a matter of communities. The problem of governance has been the central problem of humanity since forever. In this case, it's up to those communities and their existing mechanisms of governance to decide whether or not they want to move forwards. But what I'm interested in from them is telling us, what are you afraid might go wrong? What should we be looking at? What kind of intervention do you want from the available options that we can see? But this is part of the problem I was trying to point uh, Let out. me now, as a moderator, come in. I promise to you yeah. that I won't behave like those idiotic uh, TV moderators who <laughs> steer it all. But now let me make a few remarks myself. First, we seem to understand that gene drive can be extremely powerful. But there may be exaggerations of fears. This is essentially what you said, because, I mean, I've been reading your paper, uh, giving that uh, reassuring uh, statement that one intervention cannot extinguish one species. It may be true, but this, I believe, as a biologist, has to be proven, has to be looked at. And uh, I'm not so sure that proliferation of infertility or so uh, cannot um, become so powerful that eventually, it, it may take 10 years or so, a species is extinct mm -hmm. in the struggle for life against other competing species. This, I believe, has to be experimentally uh, looked at. Second, um, Ignacio has correctly said that our legal system 
is built to protect humans. It's not built to protect the environment. In a later stage, it was. But now everybody's talking about climate. And we have realized that uh, going just ahead burning fossil fuels because it doesn't kill uh, humans uh, is not a good thing. So we need a new understanding of protective law. And that is something we may be able to learn in the context of the gene drive discussion. I'm not saying we here in this room can do it right now. And then another thing I think must come in. If we have a very, very powerful tool at hand, which is attracting the inspiration of the scientific community, as I seem to observe, um, you could guess that the Pentagon and other military authorities will find that extremely important and at least do all kinds of research on, uh, of course, they always say, if the potential enemy does it, we have to be prepared. They never say that themselves uh, would be um, uh, dangerous because they call themselves defense only. Well, it's also illegal. Pardon? It's also illegal under the Biological Weapons Convention. Uh, okay. Explicitly. Uh, I've been involved in the biological weapons discussion in the early 1970s, and I know exactly this kind of language, and the dual-use kind of question uh, is in, at the floor, is in the discussion, and has to be addressed. But... Uh, as I promised a moment ago, uh, the, those five minutes are over, and with this additional widening of the agenda, I'm now inviting also uh, comments from your side, uh, and then, of course, you will have a good chance of uh, responding. You cut me off before I could involve my important cultural context point. Oh, please. Which is, look, <laughs> we engage with the Maori of Aotearoa, New Zealand, because our other project involving mice is a suppression project, developing localized suppression technologies, some of them not based on gene drive, that could be used for conservation. That's what they're interested in because Aotearoa, the land of a long white cloud, is overrun with invasive mammals that we have introduced. And they're driving many of the native species extinct. Absolutely. And current methods of control involve rodenticides often airdropped rodenticides, that the Maori view as poisoning the land and especially the water. It is completely antithetical to their beliefs. And their beliefs are different from ours in respect to obligations to the environment. You were saying legal protection of the environment. They feel very strongly about a Maori concept, and again, forgive me for my inability to translate as I've only been learning about their concept soon, is kaitiaki penga, guardianship of the land and the sacred Tonga species. And they view those species as being connected, according to Fukupapa, the relationships between species. And they view that e those ecological interactions as being more important than any kind of imagined genetic relatedness. Yeah. And so, so they are- and so, from the Maoris. And so it's important that we engage indigenous communities that have very different frameworks for evaluation of what should and should not be done. Because they view this not just as a consequentialist, would it be better to do this or not, it is, is it in alignment with our obligations to one another and to other species? But the last point that people, many people miss is, this is a question of what we owe other species, not in terms of whether or not they exist. Yes, that is true, but also what are their lives like? Because we poison over a billion, possibly as many as five billion rats and mice with super warfarin rodenticides every single year. And we know what that's like because sometimes in, in hospitals we give patients too much warfarin. It's a very hard drug to dose. It's a blood thinner. If you give them too much, you start get, getting cerebral hemorrhage, bleeding in the brain, which is commonly described by people who have suffered from it as the worst migraine you've ever had in your life, bar none, okay, except far worse. We do this to billions of animals every I single know. year that we know can feel, that we know are intelligent, that we know can suffer. And that is not even close to the greatest source of animal suffering in the world. It just happens to be one of the primary ones that we're responsible for. Yeah. So we are interested in developing these technologies to ensure that they do not have as many offspring, and therefore they will not die in horrific agony. 
And the question is, if we don't do this, but we could have, we are morally responsible for the, that continued suffering. Whether or not we are the cause of it, we are responsible for the consequences Thanks. if we I, act. I believe we have understood the argument. Point. Now, yo, please. Uh, I think we are giving one more. Okay. Please, your name and... Benny Herlin. Kevin, thanks for coming. I first really want to pay respect to your appearance here and to the way you handle uh, what you feel responsible for. I think we should say it is, for me, it is unique for a scientist to stand by his, let's call it invention for the moment, in the way you do. And I really appreciate that. My second or my question to you is, you hold patents. And uh, I not only read the, uh, your paper, but also the patent claim. And the patent basically covers more or less every conceivable application of the gene drive technology you are describing. My question now is, for what purpose and how, for what purpose did you patent it? And how will you deal with the power you have as co-patent holder together with the MIT. So that's my first question. And the second question is, from your point of view, what would be the necessary human decision-making process to actually release a gene drive which we cannot be sure can be uh, recalled or contained, as you might be, but the uncertainty is uh, given. To the first question, as you may have noticed, I'm not terribly happy with the way our society deals with the development in, of increasingly powerful technologies and decides whether or not they're going to be used. I feel that we need to fundamentally change the incentives on how science is done so that much more work needs to be done in the open. Ignacio mentioned the registry. I would love to see a registry of all gene drive experiments, and I've called for all of us to be required to pre-register our experimental plans even before we begin actual research. So in, I would love, I tried to use the patents to encourage that, but unfortunately you can't. Patents cannot be used by longstanding precedent to make a nonprofit do anything. So, but I have publicly called for the technology to remain nonprofit for the foreseeable future, meaning that nonprofits by default are granted licenses to whatever they need at no cost, but for-profit corporations of, or organizations of any form would not be granted licenses to use it. That would be my personal preference. And the second question? Second question. May I? In the, if, look, I can say, if my children lived in Africa and were at risk of malaria, I would say, if we had a suppression drive that, if target malaria had a suppression drive that, that worked, and it could definitely solve the problem on its own and they were not the complications of everything, I, my personal vote would be to release it immediately without any further risk assessments. Because I have sat in on the meetings of ecologists trying to brainstorm things that go wrong. That's, those are three mosquito species out of a thousand in Africa. There doesn't appear to be another species that feeds exclusively on them. And the known harm of malaria, to me, looks far greater than the sum total of everything that has been postulated that might go wrong. So I would vote yes if my children were at risk. Okay. No, 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 no. Different Impossible. Uh, we have this dialogue in the, in the lunch break. Uh, behind. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. I'm only making a very short, wouldn't like make a very short comment, especially because the sort of the, yeah, the insecurity with knowledge, and if you have the knowledge actually to, to be able to assess risk and actually to assess the consequences of, uh, of gene drives release. This is an uh, ecological question. We, we just heard uh, pretty much metapopulation, okay, we have actually uh, individuals coming from patch to patch, okay. This is a very dynamic system and, it's, and so far science actually wasn't able to really describe this complexity and dynamic in a way that it can be actually taken into consideration. So I'm, I'm really wondering how a gene drive system would be able to uh, be released without, uh, yeah, 
with any reasonable risk assessment. And I, I completely doubt that it works. Even though the ethical consideration, of course, uh, <clears throat> are there and the problems in Africa and all this, okay. But nevertheless, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that this is actually a problem that we currently, with the knowledge that we have, can tackle. Who am I asking? Yeah. Whoever wants to comment on that, I would happy have I can comment. Yeah, why don't you? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, yours was more of a statement, and I'm very happy to hear statements because, as I said, I think people don't only have questions. They might have really good statements. Um, and I think your statement uh, goes in the direction of something that um, is important for me, and that is the question of a null hypothesis, which is a fundamental ground base for science making, right? When you do an experiment, you say, okay, I'm going to do this intervention, and I'm going to be prepared to detect the possibility that my idea about my intervention is not going to work out the way I thought it was going to work out, and I have a plan for that. So that fundamental alternative null hypothesis, it, to me, is fundamental, and it's something that is not talked about. It, the questions here are raised as to whether to do, how to do it, when to do it, with whom to do it, not whether to do it or not. And the question is, when do you say no? When, do, when are you ready to stand back and say, you know, I'm not going to do it. And I just want one second to, re to recall, again from historical background, um, Marty Crouch. Some of you know Marty Crouch, a fantastically good uh, molecular biologist in plants, who was a very successful national manager of the, of the of Academy and a um, uh, multi-million dollar program, all these things. At some point, she realizes her hypothesis was telling her that her intervention, which was the whole program that she was running, was wrong. And she is one of the very few scientists that I know who had the power to say, I'm stopping. She finished the grants, returned some of them, and then closed her lab and wrote a paper explaining why. And that paper, which is 1982, I think, is really worth remembering because it really lays down the possibility that maybe Maybe we don't need to be obsessed about this. Maybe we actually are losing time and the moral responsibility of losing that time for looking at the alternatives that are left behind for the madness, the, the, the media-driven enthusiasm and so on for one, one specific way of doing things. Okay, a very important anecdotal answer to the general question. Now, Lily, please. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Li Ching. I'm from the Third World Network uh, from Malaysia. Um, I just wanted to bring up. Sorry, I just wanted to bring up uh, two two points. Uh, you know, and I think I wanted to really uh, bring us back to real world context. I mean, we've talked about the complexity of ecosystems, of the social context. There's also, of course, political realities. And um, I mean, just two points. One, the first issue on detection, I'm uh, glad to hear you say, uh, Kevin, that uh, the detection methods are available, that it is possible to detect. You know, but the real world situation in many developing countries is that, firstly, there's no capacity to detect. Secondly, there has been, at least with the case of GM crops, a reluctance on the part of developers to provide the detection methods. Uh, you know, and this is the real, you know, can we see a difference uh, in this situation? I don't know. I think the questions are, are still out there. The second point I'd like to bring up, uh, and I think this is, you know, really a, a very, um, it's something that actually uh, troubles me a little bit. I, I think, um, you know, malaria is a huge problem. It is a serious disease in Africa, of course. And it is something that we are confronted uh, with, not so much in my country anymore, uh, because we have largely eradicated it. Uh, but you know, we have a parallels, for example, with Aedes and uh, dengue. Um, and I think the question that, that bothers me is that if we look at where the disease happens, it is a disease of the poor, because they cannot afford the treatment or you don't have access to primary health care. It is a question of fundamental social injustice, of inequity. And we actually 
in a way, we do have the tools of, at our disposal to eradicate malaria. This week, the WHO, because of the World Health Assembly occurring now, announced two countries, Argentina and Algeria, that have eradicated malaria. It is possible to do so. It requires political will. It requires a fundamental change uh, in our approach uh, to universal, providing universal health care. It requires addressing poverty. So, I mean, these are the bigger world contexts. And my worry is that if, if we are focused on, you know, perhaps what we can say, uh, a, a noble cause like target malaria, but there is also a lot of hype surrounding this. What are we not looking at in terms of alternatives and, and real world problems that can be addressed, firstly? Secondly, uh, do we even know that the gene drive mosquitoes will work? Uh, what, what are the implications? Yeah, maybe you're not, you know, you say, okay, there's three species of mosquitoes, maybe the environmental consequence won't be so great. But are there public health uh, uh, consequences? Because uh, from what I understand, uh, when we talk about vector control uh, and we, we, we only address the vector, uh, we won't be having a holistic approach uh, to this problem. Thank you. I believe it addressed most of the I absolutely agree. People often describe gene drive and target malaria's efforts as being a single silver bullet that could solve the problem on its own, and it clearly cannot. Part of the reason why I believe that governments must all agree is because malaria is so pervasive in so many environments. The, and it's so endemic. There are some areas where people receive hundreds of infectious bites every night. And I am not a epidemiologist specializing in malaria, but I do know the person in charge of the Gates Foundation's malaria control effort fairly well, and I've talked with people who are, and they don't believe that it can be done absent some kind of new, more powerful new technology. That might be gene drive. That might be a better vaccine, because 40% protection is not going to cut it, so the current ones won't. That might be release of long-lasting ivermectin, like Bob Langer at MIT and others are trying to do. But we are going to need something, but no matter what that is, it needs to be something done in combination with everything else, which unfortunately does include insecticides, which have, in all likelihood, greater effects on other species than would biological approaches. I, for myself, would prefer that we learn to speak the language of nature when attempting to solve ecological problems rather than relying on toxic chemicals and bulldozers, which has been historically the way that we've dealt with malaria. That's not a consequentialist view, that's a personal virtue ethics preference. But we need all of the countries to agree on a systematic approach to getting to zero because as, as Doug noticed, if we don't get all the way to zero and it comes back, it will come back worse. We have 15 minutes left for the entire discussion. Uh, I believe you were for uh, the, the gentleman over this. Oh yeah, Doug. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to divert the discussion from malaria, which I think is probably, you know, in some ways the ultimate case and challenge from a number of perspectives. But I did want to address, since you, brought, you know, addressed a couple points I made, uh, to push back a little bit in, in a couple ways. Basically two points. Um, one is even short of suppression drives and even restricting a drive to, loca to geographic localities to some extent, and even taking metapopulation theory into account. Um, I think we, you know, it's a we need to look at populations or species in terms of population genetics and the broad population uh, genetic diversity within a species or several species. So again, you know, the, you know, going back to you know my basic frame of reference, which is agriculture, we are eroding the genetic diversity of both our crops and the wild relatives that we need. Um, so in the case of Palmer amaranth, for example, as a potential example, we don't necessarily have to push the species to extinction to cause significant harm. We could reduce the genetic diversity of that wild species, which reduces our potential pool of genes and so forth to breed into crops, or when we, if we breed a Palmer amaranth that is a crop, we reduce its genetic diversity, which reduces its adaptability. So I wanted to push back on the idea that suppression drives, I know you're not necessarily saying that um, other types of drives have no consequences, but we're not really talking only about suppression drives. Um, secondly, I was a, actually a biotechnology patent examiner, examiner in the 90s, mostly medical biotechnologies. 
And so I want to push back a little bit on the commercialization question that you brought up. As a species, we're very inventive. So when I was a postdoc, the gene gun had been patented. And it was out of reach of my lab, you know, uh, to, to use it. So we did protoplast fusions. Others developed um, uh, uh, carbon fiber ways of delivering genes into protoplast. We got around the patent by developing new technologies. And then if a patent is too broad, it can be challenged in the courts. Um, and so um, it's basically just to illustrate, and, and even with CRISPR, I mean, we have Talon. We've, you know, which uh, we've had zinc finger nucleases. We have evolution of the uh, CRISPR technology itself and how it works. And so I'm not nearly so sanguine that commercial entities that are, are pushed by commercial um, uh, motivations will not find new patents that get around your patent. Um, and, and, and so for both of those reasons, I think- I have to just, stop yeah, you. The subtle there are five more yeah, people yeah, waiting. That's, that's all. That's all. No chance. So uh, we simply uh, honor the um, interventions from the floor and then have a final round. Oh, thank you. Um, I think if I go to a conference about artificial intelligence or robotics or uh, medical technologies, prenatal diagnostics, and we would be talking about the dangers and the possible advantages and disadvantages, we would also be talking about complexity. We'd be talking about ethics. We'd be talking about um, applying fragmented, premature knowledge into technologies that we're using. So what, what if we make a real big step back and we talk about our inability to handle the manipulations that we're putting out in the world? Because you're focusing all of you are focusing on certain advantages and disadvantages. But what about, for instance, you're, you're all part of a machinery that puts out thousands and hundreds of thousands of new students every year and doctorates that have to invent something new to prove themselves worthy. That is the very basic of a problem. And, and before we said that we're going to make a picture here because their students strike uh, uh, on climate strike. But they're doing climate strike exactly because of science and engineer, scientists and engineers putting out technologies that we cannot handle. So my question is to either of you, what about the very basic problem of manipulating more than we can actually handle? Thank you. Um, like, like yeah, like over there, the lady, please. Because it's uh, directly in relation to what you were saying and also what uh, Lim Li Ching were saying, that uh, a lot of these technical problems are essentially political, juridical, social, and, and environmental problems. And it is a deep cultural pro uh, problem. So I, uh, I wanted to, to, uh, to thank all our panel of this extremely rich uh, uh, exchange, but I wanted to come back to what Ignacio was saying, that it is a problem of disruption, so the culture of disruption somehow. And now somehow we are, we are, we entered the fourth industrial revolution, and this is exactly what you were saying. We are now with robotics, with artificial intelligence, it is on blockchains, and all these uh, new things coming up. And so um, somehow um, described as the fourth industrial revolution. So what about the three other industrial revolutions we have already behind us? And what we see today is we are struggling very hard with the negative externalities of these three industrial revolutions. Is it biodiversity loss? Is it pollution? Is it climate change? Is it social injustice? You know? um, so, and as to say, don't you think that gene drive technologies are part of this technology fix ideology, I would even say, or technology fix culture where we think that we can solve problems by technology without regarding the broader political, social, and whatever system. And a second point on this would also no, be... We one are point is enough. I'm as sorry. Whenever... <laughs> <laughs> next, next person. Uh, we are running out of time. Are you, are you not reacting to it? Yeah, please. Hello, uh, my name's Tom Wakeford from the ETC group. 
Um, I was fascinated, uh, Kevin, about your referring to Robert Oppenheimer, a very powerful technology, a technology that wiped out in two instants over half a million people and left hundreds of thousands um, to, to die uh, uh, unseen. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer said something slightly later in his life, which I think is relevant, uh, about the any sort of um, dialogue going on with Japan before that was dropped, he said, I do not have the feeling it was done right. The ultimatum to Japan was full of pious platitudes. Our government should have acted with more foresight and clarity in telling Japan what the bomb meant. So in the context of a complex war, he was actually talking about some sort of uh, dialogue. So gene drives are a powerful technology, as you heard from other speakers. Even GM didn't allow free prior informed consent. I think I agree with Ignacio. It's, it, the whole concept is flawed when it's such a powerful technology. It gets rolled out by corporations. So I think you know, there is a body count for GM. It's linked to industrial agriculture. 40, I mean, as many people as in this room dying every two weeks in India, just in India, from drinking their own pesticides. So there's plenty of body counts to go around. Thank you. Gentlemen from Africa in the, in yes. the rear. To use your earphone, your headphones, please, to listen to the English translation and say oh, it for the for the audience. The st there should be two headphones French. on stage. Uh, it's fine. I don't need it. You understand? Right. Quand j'ai écouté Kevin, moi j'aime Kevin. Kevin, toi tu me plais beaucoup. Parce que quand je t'écoute, je sens cette volonté de sauver le monde. Je sens que tu as une conscience de sauver les Africains du palu. Mais Kevin, ce que je vais souhaiter te dire, parce que tu as dit que si tu étais un enfant africain, ta préoccupation était de voir comment ne pas mourir du palu. Sauf que ce que je vais te dire, trois choses. Kevin, tu ne connais pas les Africains. Tu ne connais pas l'Afrique. C'est pour ça que moi j'ai dit que je t'aime. Je vais te demander... Viens parler avec les Africains. Tu sauras qu'il y a un savoir endogène immense en Afrique capable de soigner le palu. Tu comprendras que le problème du palu en Afrique, c'est parce qu'il y a un business derrière le malaria que les gens font la promotion de l'industrie pharmaceutique. Kevin, si tu viens parler aux Africains, tu sauras avec moins que rien on vient à bout du paludisme. Tu sauras que les statistiques de mortalité qu'on donne, la mortalité en Afrique, c'est faux. Les gouvernements gonflent juste pour avoir des financements. Et pour terminer, Kevin, je vais te dire quelque chose. Dans mon pays, au Burkina Faso, des chercheurs burkinabés ont trouvé des plantes qui soignent le palu. Ils ont trouvé des plantes qui repulsent des moustiques. On a trouvé des villages où il n'y a pas de palud. Alors, c'est pour terminer en disant que le forçage génétique dont toi tu as la conviction, et je te crois parce que tu es sincère, peut être une solution de paludisme. n'est pas vrai. Ce n'est pas vrai parce que l'enfant africain est plus préoccupé par comment sera dans 50 ans, dans 100 ans, son environnement et sa descendance. C'est ça qui nous préoccupe, Kevin. J'espère que tu m'as compris. Merci beaucoup. OK. Um, we have less than five minutes left for the final round. You start. Ernst, would you mind summarizing that question maybe for the rest of the audience? No. Not everybody's... No time started. for that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, otherwise, we, we extend the whole thing. Uh, no. Uh, you have... <laughs> And what is the problem? Translation available. Okay. I'm only human. I can't know everything. I can't address every problem. All I can know is that each of us has an obligation to do whatever we can to make the world a better place as best we know how. And an essential aspect of that is the humility to know what we don't know. That's why I believe we need to change the way we develop science and technology. 
I wouldn't be a scientist and a technologist if I didn't believe that we can make the world a better place, that our ancestors gave us tremendous gifts in being able to enjoy the life that most of us now live. If we were, we could abandon that. We could try not to develop new technologies. But to the best of my understanding, our civilization is not sustainable. We use too much of the Earth's resources to remain as we are. That means we must continue innovating or we must allow many of us and our children to die because we cannot sustain ourselves with anything currently approaching our standard of living, let alone bringing up the many people who still suffer in the world. I think we also have obligations to the other living things we share this planet with because many of them suffer through no fault of their own. Many of them could flourish much more than they currently do if we could help them. And I think we have an obligation to consider their interests as well as those of ourselves and all of the other people on this planet. I think we have an obligation to consider the many cultures and the different forms of wisdom that they offer because they can complement those gaps and deficiencies in our knowledge. But overall, if there is one thing that I, would, I hope we can all agree to, despite our many differences in, ter in terms of technology and basic worldview and the precautionary principle and disruption, and yes, that there's something wrong with the culture mm -hmm. that celebrates disruption above all else. I think if we want to change the way we develop and use technology, we need to ensure that it is done in the open. Because now, we cannot afford to share our ideas with our peers and invite people to tell us where things might go horrifically wrong early enough for it to matter. We are depriving ourselves of advice that could lead to a better world because science evolved back when the most efficient way for me to communicate with Ignacia would be to whip out a fountainhead pen and write out a message and then have it carried on horseback and sail. That's still the system that governs us. That's why we are so secret. And we have to change that. We have to use our new advantages in communication to share what we think of doing so that others can tell us why we should not. Thank you. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. Um, I'll try to be brief. <laughs> and say first of all that I really appreciate the conversation today. I think it's rare that we have this kind of conversation in public, that the level that we had it. Um, and it's important to have this kind of conversation because we live in very confusing times. Uh, these are times where it's really hard to know what's true and what is false and what is a, a claim and what's a reality and how things are going to play out. Everything is so manipulated and I don't need to tell you that. But I wanted to take issue with one of the comments before to say that I really wish for ourselves that we try to avoid that confusion, especially to be mesmerized by things that are pushed to us, to our eyeballs especially, by media. Not really scientific publications or patents, but really the way people imagine these things will play out. Because it becomes even more confusing and we become mesmerized by it. We cannot stop looking at it. Uh, there's the candidate for presidency that I actually like in the US, Pete Buttigieg, uh, who, was, who was asked about what he was going to do about Trump. And he said, first of all, stop talking about him. Stop being mesmerized. It's hard, it's hard to, 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 to look away, he said. It's hard to look away from the, from, from the grotesque. And I am ten tempted by it all the time. And I feel that that same principle applies here, that it's really hard to stop being mesmerized by what is being presented in front of our eyes. And so, for example, I think it's important to recognize the differences between nuclear power and electronics and satellites and so on, and biotechnology. In my times of confusion, I will be done in 30 seconds, in my times of confusion, I look for different sources of information, places to look, places to ask, people to ask different uh, ways of ap approaching this. And in biotechnology in general, it has always been a very good place to go to ask the weirdest people who are the financiers. And look at the, at the stock market. What's happening with the promises of 
you know, 40 years ago in biotechnology or 20 years ago or 10 years ago. And what are the so-called synthetic biology companies that are the current drive of this? You know, next thing is going to be the CRISPR companies. Um, what's happening with their stock? What are people really thinking about them? And if you look, for example, at the history, if you look at the history of every single one of these companies, they have this pattern. People believe in it, and then they don't deliver, and the people believe in it, become mesmerized, and they drop. Um, Intrexon is a really good example, right? It's, it's kind of sad to see. And so there are places where we can look to prevent that becoming mesmerized and to gain clarity in what is really, really uh, confusing times. But most importantly, I believe, and this is back to you, that I believe these networks of trust and networks of communication that I very much feel like we, I want to welcome you to my network of trust to continue conversing um, are incredibly important to gain clarity and to avoid the confusion that is being thrown at us every day. Thank you. Wonderful. Let me make very, very few um, summary remarks. Transparency, as you emphasize, is extremely important. I very much appreciate your making things public and allow for discussion. I thank you for your accepting the invitation. Um, we need, uh, we have to use technology chiefly for solving problems that are evident for humanity and for nature. That's very good, indeed. However, as two interventions uh, have said in, uh, a moment ago, there is a certain danger of us overdoing technology, overdoing speed, coming into a civilization of disruption, etc. That, I believe, is a fundamental problem to be recognized. During my years in research in biological cybernetics, I was learning as one of the first principles Living systems cannot live without negative feedbacks. Negative feedbacks are stabilizing the system. Positive feedbacks are exploding the system. But today's economy is only positive feedbacks. And this is wrong. This kills our society, kills uh, the uh, stability uh, which we need. So I believe um, the adoration of speed and the incentive structure that always makes the speediest win is a big, big cybernetic mistake. And we need the kind of, well, technology assessment, precautionary principle, and transparent discussion among all involved, including the victims, um, to uh, put a break on certain trends that we feel could become disastrous. As we have done, not fully successfully, with nuclear fission. I mean, had we just gone on, uh, gone on uh, like uh, the, in this disruptive technology, the uh, civilization of the world would have been exploded. So uh, we can learn it. And I hope that this discussion on gene drive will help um, educate ourselves on both the excitement with interesting new uh, technologies and the societal needs for negative feedbacks to control it all. Thank you very much for an exciting discussion, and I believe now we have a lunch break. Thank you.